Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jennifer Tremel from Stanford University on today's uh, Sensei Podcast. Thank you so much again, Jennifer, for taking the time to be with us this morning and uh, talk to us about your journey with CTO and Complex Intervention. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I look forward to this. Wonderful. So Jennifer, you're one of the best universities in the world. You're doing some of the most complex cases. And typically, most people who do this are in smaller places and uh, much less uh, um, academic rigor as a Stanford. So tell us, how were you able to make it work in one of the premier places in the world to have this complex CTO intervention program? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think we obviously all have a journey through this. Um, you know, for me, it was important that we bring CTOs up into the modern era at Stanford. Um, I think like everyone many years ago, you know, we were poking and hoping um, and that's how we did CTOs. Um, and, you know, we did them and half worked and half didn't. <laughs> and that was kind of how it went. Um, and, you know, Stanford, it, it kind of has a big name, but it's actually a pretty moderate sized program. And, um, you know, we functioned well as a group and kind of each having our own niches and um, in that way, kind of covering everything. And, uh, you know, I'm I like corners. I never got into structural and um, there's other people doing structural. And and as somebody doing corners, I kind of felt like, you know, once CTOs really changed, it was like, well, I'm not really a coronary person if I can't do all coronaries. Um, and we didn't really have anybody that had kind of stepped up and said, I want to do CTOs because, you know, they were doing other stuff. And so it, it was kind of it was a very natural fit. Um, it worked for me, something I wanted to do. And it worked for our program as well. Uh, so that's that's kind of how it started. Um, and, you know, it just kind of, I think, completes us as an institution. Right. We should be able to take care of any any patient from an interventional perspective. And how were you able to learn the basic skills? Did you go to other labs? Did you have people come over to your lab? Since, you know, these techniques are not, especially when you started them, they were not very commonly used. How did you make this uh, happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I owe a lot to um, Bill Lombardi, as I know a lot of people do. And he was actually, at that time, kind of going around and, you know, <laughs> telling people, hey, do this CTO thing. Um, and I, when he first he came to Stanford, he would come periodically to Stanford and and all of us would kind of watch and see what he was doing. And, you know, at that time, I was kind of still into doing radials. And uh, so that was my focus. But luckily, that kind of got old after a while. And so when I was thinking about doing CTOs, I called him and I said, you know, I'm, I think I'm seriously going to you know, focus on this. And um, so I went up to UW for a week. Um, hung out, watched cases, uh, and got back, had absolutely no clue what I was supposed to do. <laughs> it's just, you know, it was, it was kind of an overwhelming experience. I mean, he was definitely uh, far in advance of, you know, somebody just kind of starting out. So it was one of those, like, I don't know what just happened. Um, but uh, I also then had proctors come in um, who were fantastic. Um, you know, Mike Wyman came in, uh, Aaron Grantham came. Um, so, you know, I, I, that, that was really important. Um, and, you know, one thing about where I am is it was just me. And, you know, I think that's a challenge um, if you're all by yourself. Um, you know, you can, you can watch other operators and you can read stuff and that sort of thing. But when you're actually into practice um, and you're by yourself, that's hard because you're often venturing into absolutely unknown um, from your own perspective. So, um, but certainly watching other people in their lab and then having proctors come in, I, I, it's vital. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine starting without having proctors come in and really give you some tips and trips, confidence, uh, or confidence and like knowing when you can push, <laughs> when you shouldn't push, you know, those very basic things um, are really important. 
And then how supportive was the environment? Were your colleagues supportive? Did they see the need uh, for uh, uh, this uh, program? Did you have any challenges there? H how did that all uh, evolve? Are other people going to be watching this? Like, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I mean, in, so in general, where I am, it's uh, they're they're very supportive of you know starting people starting new things um, as long as you know if you're successful at doing it, and that's one reason why I've stayed here, right? I mean, I've been able to start a women's heart health program. I started radials. I started Anoka testing. And I started CTOs, right? So, um, and they have always been like, they let me do it. Um, and, you know, so that, that and that's really important. Um, you know, getting patients is another thing, right? And um, I think there is a, it's, I think it's hard for people, especially when they do CTOs um, to start to refer their patients, right? We're all coronary people. And so I think it's challenging when you do coronaries and you've done CTOs um, kind of in the traditional way, and some of them work, to actually stop and say, I'm not even going to attempt this. I'm going to send it to my colleague who might be a junior colleague to me um, and have them do this. So we kind of went through some, I think, some growing pains in terms of um, me asking if they could maybe not stick wires in <laughs> places. Um, and I, I think people don't always, people that don't do CTOs don't always kind of are able to distinguish between this is a hard C, harder CTO and this is an easier CTO. They're just kind of all CTOs and I'll put in something and see what happens. And, um, and you know, if somebody puts something in and, and they basically even just get subintimal, but they're not a CTO operator, they're done. Um, but now they've also made this track and they've, you know, been in there. And so now I'm dealing with kind of not a fresh CTO, which I prefer to have a fresh one when I start and I can mess it up and not somebody else. So, um, you know, so some of that, um, you know, but I think uh, in general, again, I'm in a very supportive environment um, and very fortunate that way. And then how um, has it been in terms of, uh, psychology, you know, complications happen, uh, cases can be challenging, failures can happen. How are you able to handle that? Uh, is that come easy to you? Do you have any techniques? Yeah, uh, I don't know if that comes easy to anybody, but I don't know. Um, maybe you know better. I, I haven't really, uh, I haven't watched your podcast. Maybe people think it's easy. Uh, I think that's the hardest part of CTOs, right? I mean, the, the technical parts, um, you, you know, you learn as you go along, you get better at them as you do with any technique. Um, the psychology um, is you have to work on yourself. Um, and I think a lot of it depends on how kind of good you are dealing with that. Um, you know, these are stressful cases, particularly when you're starting, um, you will fail. <laughs> and we're not good at failing, any of us. Um, no, no physician is used to failing and certainly interventional cardiologists are not um, people who fail. And um, so accepting that you're going to fail and, and kind of changing what fail means um, and recognizing that that doesn't mean you're a failure, <laughs> um, I think is important. Um, you know, I remember you know, when I started, I mean, for months, I would have quite a bit of anxiety around. So I do my CTOs on Wednesdays. I have kind of a designated day. And um, Wednesdays were, you know, kind of the... the <laughs> peak anxiety day of the week, um, you know, I'd be quite anxious about what I was heading into, you know, was, am I going to be able to take care of this? Am I going to kill this person? And, you know, I mean, these very real fears around it. Um, and I, that went on for a, quite a while. And to the point that I was like, God, am I, is, am I supposed to be doing this? Am I made to do this? Um, and, you know, I stuck with it through kind of that discomfort and, um, you know, it got better. And I, I guess I'd be surprised if anybody doesn't go through that, um, you know, whether or not people recognize it or want to acknowledge it, I don't know. But um, if you're not having some anxiety like that, I'd actually be a little bit nervous about <laughs> you as an operator. Um, 
because you should <laughs> probably, um, you know, but I think it's just one of those things you, I, I think it's, that's probably a very pivotal point when it distinguishes people who really want to do CTOs versus not, right? If you kind of get into the, into doing it and that emotional aspect is just a, too much, um, that's probably a sign like this isn't for me and that's okay, right? Um, Cause this isn't going to be for everybody. Um, but give it a little time and it may get better. If it gets better, you're on the right path. If it doesn't, it's not for you. Wonderful. And then in terms of the um, radiation, things like that, are you doing anything special for radiation to protect yourself in the lab or uh, how, how concerned are you about that? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a big concern. I didn't think about radiation as much as I should have um, until I started doing CTOs. And that really kind of made me wake up. And at the time that I was starting it, we were on, um, I was on our best machine, which was like this old GE machine. And um, man, the grays would climb fast. And uh, particularly if I had a big guy on the table. And uh it was kind of startling, um, you know, and at that point, I mean, we used standard shields, you know, I'd have a rad pad, um, but you don't stand behind the fellow. That used to always be my thing, stand behind the fellow, right? But as you know, when you're doing CTOs, um, you know, the fellow's typically standing here and you're a primary operator, um, unless you have a, you know, chip or CTO fellow. And um, so during that time, fortunately, we, you know, got, moved to a new hospital, got better machines. I was shocked at like, you know, radiation dropped in half immediately. So I think having a good system to begin with, I mean, you know, the systems have gotten quite good and can help minimize that. Um, we're still a little behind. So we're just now going to, you know, get, get Rampart in, um, you know, which I know a lot of people have been doing this for years. Um, so I would say um, it's something that I've, We've been a little slow um, on doing, but it's certainly uh, in my awareness and something that I've been trying to get less and less. And it has been getting better and better. Um, and it's something we all need to pay attention to. And fortunately, there are a lot of you know newer ways of reducing radiation. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, with these long cases, you absolutely need to make sure that you're doing that. Perfect. And how do you plan for your cases? Do you have a specific routine? Do you spend a specific amount of time? How do you plan for your CTOs and uh, complex cases? This day? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I would say, I mean, you were always really good about kind of describing to people how to do that. Um, and in my mind, like, <laughs> the way you describe it is like, gosh, it sounds like Mono spends like hours looking at his cases and, uh, you know, which I thought was a good lesson, not that you need to spend hours, but, um, you know, to really look at the cases. I'd say my routine's kind of fallen into, um, you know, Tuesday, I have clinic on all day Tuesday and at the end of clinic, um, knowing Wednesday's CTO day, um, you know, I kind of pull up what's coming tomorrow, right? So, I don't look too far ahead because I don't need that in my brain, right? <laughs> um, but I do, I actually believe in the power of your mind working while you're sleeping. Um, and so I like to know the night ahead. Um, I don't know if any magic happens in there, but why not, <laughs> right? And um, so, you know, I look at the cases, um, obviously figure out what which artery we're doing, <laughs> but um, you know, what, what are we dealing with, right? Um, where, you know, how long is it? How calcified is it? Um, you know, what are my options going to be? How does it look for re-entry? What are the collaterals like? Um, you know, how does retrograde look? Um, you know, and I, I think these cases can go any way, right? I mean, so you can make the best of plans, um, but you know, then who knows? Um, so I think it's important to, you know, have a real good sense of these view these pictures um, and a good sense of what you're going to do, um, but also be open, of course. And, you know, you learn a lot the day you do dual injections too, right? So things will sometimes look very different, um, sometimes pleasantly different, <laughs> sometimes not. Sometimes you're like, oh, I hope this is going to look better when I do a, do a dual injection and it doesn't look any better. Um, but, um, you know, that's, that's kind of what I do. And that's about the extent of it. Um, 
but I try to kind of become one with the CTO before uh, I head in with it. Perfect. And then are there any cases that have uh, stuck with you, uh, good or bad ones over the years that taught you a lot, that you found them very uh, useful? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you learn from every case. Um, there's, there's no doubt you learn from every case. I think, um, and you learn, you certainly learn from the ones that don't go well, um, but you also will have these moments during your learning where something you've been kind of trying works. And you're like, oh, that's how it works, <laughs> right? Um, or you'll do something a little braver than, you know, what you had done before, right? And um, so you kind of will step up a little as you're learning, right? Um, there's something you maybe were a little hesitant to try on other case. You're like, this time I'm gonna try it, right? And it's like, oh, okay. Um, you know, so I think those are probably the most pivotal moments. Um, and I mean, I think they, I, I think they happen a lot. I mean, CTOs are very unique uh, in terms of all of the um, variety um, that you get on each case. And, um, you know, you just kind of don't know what's going to suddenly um, present itself as a new way of getting the artery open. Um, so, you know, I don't know if I can come up with a very specific case, but I would probably say there's, you know, hundreds, pretty, pretty much everyone you learn from. Um, and, you know, learning's incremental. And, um, you know, things that were profound at one moment, right? Now it's, it's kind of routine, right? And something else becomes kind of profound um, and, and exciting that you, another hurdle you overcome. And what are the things that you found the most difficult to learn? Was it the wires, the mental part of it? Well, what parts did you find the hardest things to assimilate and get into practice? Yeah. Um, I think I actually, I mean, I still struggle a little with tearing up the artery as much as I probably should. <laughs> that's a, I think that's probably one of my um, uh, challenges still. Um, and I'm not, I, it, I, I'm not sure why. I mean, I think it's part of my, it's your nature, right? And I can, I think Lombardi again, like kind of says there's three things you need to do. I can't remember, but one's like finesse and one's like, you just keep doing it till you hit something. And then the others, you, you know, push harder, tear the crap out of it, whatever. Um, you know, finesse, I, you know, I got finesse, um, I will stick with something. I mean, I'm, you know, I can, well, I'll keep trying if I need to. Um, but I think the kind of, you know, push harder, tear it up sort of things, a little challenging. I think some of it's probably I just don't like to make things messy, which um, that's, a, <laughs> that's just a personal problem. But I think the other thing is being alone, again, it's hard. It's harder to push yourself into a place where you may cause damage. Um and, and you don't have somebody else to say, yeah, I think pushing here would be, you know, let's go for it, right? It's just you. It's like, should we go for it? Yeah, let's go for it. Or, um, you know, so I think that's where some of the hangup is. It's, you know, some of it's personal, some of it's my environment that I don't kind of always have, um, you know, someone else encouraging me as well to, to push into that. Um, I think the, when you're starting the emotional part's a big issue. Um, I don't, I don't feel that as much anymore, which is good because um, that was exhausting, I, I think. Um, and so it, it's nice when that sorts, sort of dissipates. Um, but I definitely, I, I think, I mean, definitely I'm still a learner. Um, I don't know if you ever stop being a learner with CTOs. Um, if you do, I haven't reached that. Perfect. Well, I think most people say that this is an ongoing process and no matter how much you learn, there's always been more and more to learn. I think CTO is actually perfect for that. Yeah. So I'm fascinated about the sign behind you saying happy. So are you happy <laughs> or is it because of CTO PCI? I, I didn't write that, but uh, anyway, yeah. you know, I'm pretty happy right now. Yeah. Um, you know, I've been, I don't know, are we talking, I can talk outside CTOs a little bit, but, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm kind of in mid-career, right? And, um, you know, I think it's a time you kind of, 
step back a little and look and say, you know, you kind of try to jump off the treadmill a little and say, you know, is this going the way I want? Um, and I've been trying to kind of focus a little bit on just life in general. Um, and, you know, having work fit into that life, um, but not be the entire life. Um, and it's, it's a challenge, I think, to do it. Um, but I'm finding ways of kind of, you know, keep I, keeping a balance a little bit better than I used to. And um, I think that actually brings the right kind of attitude to work and um, keeps attention focused where it should be, as opposed to being all over the place. And, you know, certainly CTOs um, are, I, I mean, I enjoy being in the lab in general because um, it's a place where I can just, you know, that's all I do. Um, you know, nobody can bother me. They can try, um, but I will tell them I'm busy. <laughs> and um, I can just focus on one thing and, it's an active thing um, to be doing. It's obviously, you know, physically, mentally active and it's focused. And um, I find that to be actually a very calming place to be. Um, I enjoy that. Um, and so CTOs, uh, I think, add to that. I mean, obviously it can get frustrating uh, as well, but for the most part, that's a nice kind of calm, quiet time. And then what else do you do to maintain the balance? Because obviously doing these cases and this kind of patients can be, as you said, fairly draining and very intense. So what else do you do to keep uh, in good shape? Do you exercise? Do you meditate? What do you yeah. do? Uh, so I, well, I do a lot of other things, but um, yeah, well, running is kind of my big thing right now. Um, you know, I ran in high school and uh, a little bit in college. And then kind of on and off during training, um, it seemed like, you know, on your, I don't know, nuclear medicine month, you'd start working out, right? And then you'd hit the CCU and then you'd stop working out or whatever. Um, so I, you know, ran on and off. And then, um, gosh, what was this? In 2019, I think I kind of hit a, well, 2018, I hit a low point, probably in a sort of physical health. I had just written a grant. Um, so I sat on a couch for like three months writing a grant and I was like, this isn't working, right? Like this, this is not a healthy life. And, um, you know, so 2019 just kind of popped in my head, like you should run a marathon, which, um, I was also coming up to a pivotal, uh, milestone year, right. <laughs> to be named, uh, later. But, um, so I decided at this particular age, I was going to run a marathon, which was 2020. And so I started training for the marathon um, and then COVID hit, right? And there were no marathons in 2020. And uh, so then it, I was like, well, um, you know, I put in a lot of training and I thought, well, I'm going to run my marathon next year, right? So I trained for yet another year. Um, and so it was two and a half years I basically trained for a marathon. And um, so in 2021, I ran my first marathon ever. Um, I had, I'd run halves, but I'd never run a marathon. Um, it was the Des Moines Marathon. I'm from Iowa, if uh, people wow. don't know. And um, nice. it went quite well. I actually was the top female masters runner in that race, um, a masters runners 40 and over. And I qualified for the Boston Marathon, um, which was unexpected and um, really nice. And so I started training for that, which uh, 2022 was the year that I would be able to do that. And um, some people know the story about, but it was about six to eight weeks before CTO Plus actually, or it was actually six to eight weeks before the marathon, the day before I was leaving for CTO Plus. Uh, I tore my adductor <laughs> and probably fractured my pelvis, got a stress fracture. Um, and so that kind of ruined my Boston Marathon. That's why you didn't see me at the front with the elites that year. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, so that was unfortunate. I actually was, was packing for CTO Plus on walking sticks and had to use them to get through the airport because I couldn't bear weight on my leg and i remember going up to the podium at that meeting and being afraid i was gonna fall on the stairs but i didn't want to use the walking sticks because that would have been weird i thought so um but i made it up there but so i had to walk boston that year 
Um, but I did go and it was a good experience. And I was out for 10 months uh, with this injury and um, just kind of around the beginning of this year, started training again. And um, my hope is to requalify. So um, hopefully I will be back in Boston and actually running in 2023. Uh, so everyone root for me. Um, but that's what I'm doing now. And um, it's a it's like having a part time job. Uh, it's very time consuming. I would say, you know, it's about 20 hours a week at peak training in terms of, you know, you're obviously running time, you're, uh, you know, getting ready for your runs, um, recovering from your runs, you know, planning your runs, whatever. It's um, it's quite time consuming. So when you exercise um, and you have a routine like that, your life starts to shift around it, right? Um, you can't do it in a bubble. And it starts to, I think, affect a lot of other healthy lifestyle things, right? So you eat differently, you eat better, right? You need energy and you need good energy for, for training, obviously. Um, you can't drink as much. <laughs> it doesn't feel good uh, to go run in the morning if you've been drinking the night before. Um, and I think one of the biggest things is sleep, actually, right? So you need sleep um, for recovery. And um, I get up very early, um, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, to get to work in time and get my workout done. I have my alarm set for 3.40 in the morning. Um, and so I, I get up very early. Um, to get my runs done and to get to work on time. And that requires me then you have to go to bed early, right? Um, and so I go to bed at an oddly early hour. Um, people think it's weird and it is weird, um, but it's really kind of the only way this all works for me. Um, you know, and I think, I mean, the running thing, it obviously has a lot of analogies with life and even CTOs and um, you know, but it's like Wednesdays, my CTO day is also my speed workout day. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know, I'll do usually about an eight mile run with speed intervals in the middle of it. And, um, you know, I'm doing that in the dark in my neighborhood, um, in the morning, sometimes, you know, in the rain or whatever. And, um, it's, that's exhausting. And so usually the hardest part of my day is done before I even get to work. <laughs> so it makes CTOs a lot easier. It's like, whew, well, that other stuff's done. Um, you know, now I just have to do these CTOs. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I spend a lot of my free time. But, um, you know, I also like to read and I, uh, I like to, I cook and I hang out with my husband and we have quiet, you know, quiet time. I like to be at home. Um, you know, it feels like we're not home that much and I just like to be at home, um, if I can. Perfect. Well, as you say, that's a good way to prepare for your CTOs. Once you are exhausted after all this, then probably you're much less stressed out about minor details. So that has definitely some advantage. Yeah, that's very true. I actually was thinking um, like two Sundays ago, I was on a run and a bee flew in my mouth while I was running. Um, and fortunately, I didn't get stung and I like got it out in this kind of ball of spit. It was suspended in the spit. <laughs> but I was like, I was like, well, you know, I've never had a bee fly in my mouth during a CTO. So, um, <laughs> so this isn't so bad. <laughs> it could always, always be worse. There you go. So, so Jennifer, how about uh, any favorite books or movies that you have, or there's no time to read anymore because of all the training? <laughs> yeah. Um, now I do find time. I do find time to read. I, you know, I didn't read for many years. Um, I always liked reading and then I stopped reading. I think part of it was like during training, you didn't want to read. I don't think, um, you know, right. You read a lot during school and it was just, you didn't want to read. And then, um, and then I started reading again and I, it was like, I was doing something wrong. I remember thinking like, somebody's going to catch me doing this. This feels too luxurious, right? I should be working. Um, you know, that those kinds of feelings. And, um, so slowly incorporated my life and slowly told myself it was okay if I read for 15 minutes. It's okay. Um, so I do enjoy reading. Um, you know, I, I like to read real books if I can, um, but I also listen to books um, just for convenience sake, I would say. And that's actually kind of, that's how I go to bed at night um, is that I will put in my audio book and, uh, 
I found that's a good way to kind of get my mind off of other stuff, right? I think a lot of our problems with sleep is our minds are going. Um, I'm sorry if you can hear that beeping, but um, no, okay. Um, but our, you know, our minds are kind of going and it's a good way to just have your mind on one thing. And, um, so I just kind of fall asleep with someone reading to me. Um, and, uh, that's a nice way to get in, you know, you get a book done if you do that slowly over time. Um, so I enjoy that. Um, you know, movies, I'm pretty bad on current events. I often have no clue what's going on out in the world because, again, there's only so much time and that's not a big focus of mine. <laughs> I mean, it probably should be, but I just, you know, I can't do everything. And um, so on periodically, you know, uh, Chris and I will watch a movie and, um, you know, that's like a fun thing to do. But, uh, you know, with my early bedtime, um, sometimes we have to now split it up. <laughs> old people right well at dinner at five and then maybe we'll watch the movie for an hour and then that's it and then maybe the next night we can finish it um so um you know i in terms of like favorites um you know i kind of it's funny with favorite things i guess i always think of these things as like um if you think about wine right if somebody says what's your favorite wine it it just depends right it depends on what mood you're in. It depends on what you're eating. It depends, you know, I, on all these kind of those things. And I kind of feel the same about books and movies and songs. Um, you know, I like a whole lot of different ones and it really depends, um, you know, on what mood I am, where I am in life, um, what I'm looking for. So, um, you know, so I don't know if I have a specific favorite or anything like that. Um, I do, you know, music wise, I'm also behind on music. I'd say I'm still stuck in like the nineties and stuff. But, uh, and when I, you know, when I warm up in the morning, I dance, that's how I warm up. Um, I like dancing, I've always liked dancing. And so I get a little dancing in, uh, you know, several days a week when I'm warming up. Uh, but usually to, you know, some old hip hop song that everybody else, it would be embarrassing if anybody actually saw that, so. Well, maybe we'll, we'll make sure we have some like, good music on the next city. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, I don't know if you saw this, but there was this, there was this uh, talk, this chat um, online about do people have music in their lab or not? And, you know, some people have music in their lab. Actually, it sounds like most people do. And, you know, I don't allow music in my lab. And I think a lot of my staff just think I'm kind of stuffy and, you know, she doesn't want music. But in fact, I cannot stand still. Um, and I actually don't know how people go through life and have music around and kind of hold still um, because I just start moving. And I that's why I can't have it in the lab. I would just be highly distracted um, and start moving around and probably singing, which definitely nobody wants to hear me do that. Um, so, uh, so I don't have music in my lab when I work. <laughs> well, well, everyone is different, yeah. but uh, you're right. Might be, might be a little too many movements for the for the CTO to yeah. happen properly. So. Those are definitely advanced techniques, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe for the sexual reentry, maybe a bonus. <laughs> yeah. So, so Jennifer, what are you most proud of for the many things that you've done, the many fields you started, and both medicine and outside? What are the things that you are the most proud of? You know, I think um, I think one my career has always been directed at kind of filling gaps. Um, and places where I, at least I think we're not doing a great job, <laughs> right? And the patients that I feel like we're not taking care of. And, um, you know, I have kind of this weird practice in that, you know, I do CTOs, so I do totally blocked arteries, um, but I take care of ANOCA, right? So I do patients with totally open arteries as well. Um, and the commonality here is angina. Right. And the commonality is that these are both groups of patients where in interventional cardiology, we have not done well <laughs> taking care of them, I would say. Um, you know, they're both ignored. Um, they kind of fall outside of traditional practice, easy, what we're taught to do. 
Um, and these are the people that it bothers me the most. Like I can't ignore that. <laughs> right. And a lot of people ignore it. Um, and I just, I can't, um, and I feel an obligation to help those people. Um, and, and so I think, you know, at least personally, that's probably what's most important to me, um, is that I haven't been afraid to head into areas that other people are, you know, ignoring, don't think is important. Um, you know, it's not hot. I mean, at the time, anyway, it becomes hot, it seems like, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not where other people are going. Um, and that's where I'm actually drawn. Um, and to make a difference and often to make a difference very quietly, I would say in people's lives. Um, so, you know, I think that's probably the most important thing. I mean, for both of these patient populations, you know, there's increasingly things we can do. Uh, fortunately, there's an increasing awareness and focus. And, you know, it had, like I said, it has kind of, they become a little hot, which is great. I mean, that's, that's what we need. Um, but they continue to both be areas where, um, you know, a lot of people aren't doing anything and they're not referring them to people that can do something, right? And and that's what we need to do with both these patient populations is, you know, if you at least recognize them and if you don't wanna take care of them, which I get, right? I mean, CTOs are hard. It takes years to learn how to do it. Anoka is annoying, right? You don't get to put a stent in, which is the most fun thing to do. Um, you know, they, the med, we don't have great uh, trials yet about treatment. Um, these patients sometimes suffer for years and you're, you're you know, there are a lot of work too. So if you don't want to take care of these patients, fine. Um, but at least recognize them and at least, under, at least understand there are people that will take care of them um, and get them to somebody who will, as opposed to just, you know, ignoring them, blowing them off, telling them they're fine, you know, oh, it's just angina, right? Um, well, you know, if it's just angina and it's an 80% LED, you just put a scent in it, right? But the other people, it's like, oh, it's just angina, deal with it. And that's not a, that's not a consistent message, right? Um, we should have a consistent message, I think, for all of our patients um, and hopefully offer them the best that they can get, um, whether or not we are able to provide that. Somebody can. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. And that's the area that is probably the most rapidly growing area right now in coronary world where people are understanding better the microvasculature and other causes of angina. And that can, as you said, make a huge impact down the line. Mm. Um, how, um, how about uh, your um, um, other things that uh, you are looking forward go down the line? Like what excites you the most going forward? Um, yeah, I think, um, like I said, I'm, I'm actually... I'm, I'm, I don't know if increasingly, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in kind of understanding how to have a life <laughs> to, you know, to really, you know, to, to have a, to have a broader life. Um, you know, I, medicine, if medicine's, I don't want medicine to be my whole life. Um, it's an important part of my life, right? But it's not my whole life. And I, I think that actually starting to discover your whole life and all parts of you makes you better at medicine. Um, and it makes you better able to take care of people. Um, but it's hard to get there, right? Because I think we feel like if we don't do this all the time, something's going to slip, right? Something somebody's not going to ask us to do something. We're not going to be the best at it. You know, we have to keep going or it's scary to stop. Um, it's, you know, it's scary to turn that off and it's, it's easier to keep doing this and, you know, just keep working, keep working, keep working. That's easier actually. And that's why people do it, right? It's safer. Um, and I'm actually really interested in kind of, can I have, you know, a broader life, um, and do both and actually transition between both and not have to worry that somehow um, I'm going to get worse at one by having the other. Um, and, and I think in this kind of path of discovery of that, um, the truth is actually that they enhance each other, right? And that you're more present um, and more engaged for both um, when you have kind of both aspects of this world, right? Of your own personal things um, 
and medicine at the same time. So, and that's a life, that's a lifelong endeavor too. You can't like do that over the weekend. It's not like, oh, Monday, I'm going to have a balanced life, right? (laughs) I tried that. It doesn't work. (laughs) (laughs) It would be nice. Uh, Yeah, it would be nice. Um, But, you know, so that's an ongoing practice. I mean, life's a practice. Learning CTOs is a practice, you know, getting enough sleep's a practice, becoming a marathon runner is a practice, um, you know, and it's actually fun. I, I think it's fun to engage in these practices and it's it's fun to look at it as a practice. Um, it's, you know, if you if it's a practice, it's, o- it's more okay if it doesn't go well one day, right? Um, because you're practicing and, you know, we don't want to call it practicing or impatience or whatever, but it's a practice, right? And so some days, wow, you nail it, right? And some days, you know, it didn't go so well. How can we make it better next time? You know, and you just kind of keep showing up um, and you keep this practice. Um, and so that's that's kind of where I am now. And, and that's what I'm interested in. I, it's not as exciting as, you know, probably, you know, whatever the next novel CTO thing is or whatever. But, um, you know, I think, I don't know. That's, that's, that's interesting to me right now, <laughs> I guess. Well, and it is a huge point, right? As we all hear that the burnout rates are going up, people are stressed out. They don't find meaning in what they're doing. They don't enjoy their jobs. They want to work less. There's exactly a lot of discussion. And I think the solution is what you just said, you know, taking time to figure out, you know, what exactly it is for you, because it's not for everyone. I mean, you can not find a solution that will help everyone's burnout because everyone is different and they have different things they want and different things that make them tick. So I think this makes perfect sense. Yeah. And then, you know, being in a place of burnout is tough because then it's, it's hard to even see the way, right? You're just, you're, you're fried. Um, you cannot see the big picture. And that's, that's one reason why people continue doing this is because, they don't know what else to do. They don't have time for their brain to kind of be like, okay, you know, I need to try to do this or that um, to start to unravel this knot um, of burnout that's been created. Um, and it's, it is a knot, right? I mean, that's why it takes so long. And you, you know, you do one thing at a time and try to keep adding on to that until that knot starts to unwind. Um, so, you know, it, it takes a long time. It takes, it takes courage to do that. Um, and it takes patience. And I mean, I think it takes all the skills that one needs also if they're going to do CTOs, right? Um, you have to be brave. Um, you have to be patient. Uh, you have to be willing to fail and get back up and try again. This is a great advice uh, for everyone, including those who want to learn CTO. But uh, Coming back to that, what would be your advice to the younger generation, those who are starting now or are in fellowship or early in their careers and they want to get into this area? Uh, would you recommend that they go into this? And what would you advise them to do? Yeah. Well, I always think people should do follow their passion, right? That's kind of a you know generic saying. But I mean, you really, I mean, you, you need to do what really appeals to you. Um, you know, and obviously, if you're in medicine, that must have appealed to you. And if you got in cardiology, that appealed to you. Um, you know, but what I see a lot, particularly like when we interview people for, you know, interventional fellowship would be a good example. You know, they come in and it's like, well, you know, what do you want to do? And and whatever's hot at that time, that's what they want to do. <laughs> right. I mean, I remember like many years ago, it was like uh, peripheral was hot. Right. And every fellow wanted to do peripheral. Right. And then every fellow wanted to do Tabber. Right. And, you know, so it, it kind of that worries me because it's like, is that really suddenly everyone has the same passion? There's no way. Right. Um, they're they're following whatever it's like. Oh, I want to do the cool thing. Um, right. I want to do, you know, whatever everybody's doing. Um, you know, I, I mean, if you really don't know, I guess that's one thing, right? You follow the masses and see what everybody else is doing. Um, but, you know, what really do you like? Um, I, I would much rather have a fellow come in. Now they'll all do this. But, you know, come in and say, you know, I'm not totally sure. You know, C, CTOs look cool. Structural looks good. 
um, yeah, I kind of want to test the waters and see what really draws me in if they don't already kind of have that instinct of, of what they really want to do. Um, you know, I, I like right now, I, I don't see fellows coming in and say, saying, oh, I just want to do coronaries. Um, I've had a couple, but for the most part, right, it's you don't you have to say you want to do all this other stuff. And um, so so I think that's really important. Um, and with the recognition, of course, you know, one wonderful thing about interventional cardiology is that it it changes um, and new things come along. Right. Um, and what I found in my career is, you know, about every five to seven years, I kind of get bored, so to speak, with what I'm doing, meaning that I've kind of grasped it and, you know, I I feel like I got it. I've gotten to teach people how to do it. I've gotten tired of hearing myself talk, <laughs> right? And I'm like, it's time for something new, right? And and the nice thing about interventional is there often is something new, right? And, and then you can start again. And I think, um, so that's a wonderful aspect. Not everyone takes advantage of it though, um, because starting stuff new, particularly once you're in your career, again, is hard, right? You you have to suddenly not be the best at it. Um, and a lot of people are just will not go there. Um, but unfortunately then what you become is an old person that does the same thing you did 30 years ago. And that's, that's really unfortunate in this field because there's just too many opportunities to learn new things. Um, so I, I would tell fellows or do tell them when they're starting out, you know, make sure you're doing something you enjoy um, and make sure that you kind of keep up with things and change and don't be scared to not be good at something again um, and to learn it because you'll get good again, right? We, we can all learn things um, as we go along. Um, don't be afraid to ask for help, um, you know, and and think that that makes you weak. It's the people who aren't asking for help that are weak, right? They're scared. Um, asking for help is, is a brave thing to do. Um, you know, getting proctors, having mentors, all of that. Um, and then, of course, I would encourage this sort of finding your other life, right? <laughs> right. Um, and I don't know how you I don't know how you kind of tell people that. I think people have to find that. Um, and it may be the the current generation may be better at that. I don't really know. I, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. So we, uh, if it wasn't hard, it wasn't worth doing. Right. <laughs> um, and I don't think that was necessarily always the best approach. Um, not everything has to be, you know, so hard. Uh, so, you know, but I think having a full life, um, you know, burnout, I didn't believe in burnout when I first started. I was like, nah, other people have burnout. <laughs> I don't have burnout. Um, but, you know, it can creep up on you <laughs> after years and years. So, um, you know, find balance. Um, recognize that doing some things outside of work makes you better at work um, and makes you more present at work, I would say. Um, so that, those would be some of my advice for people starting out. Perfect. So essentially, be broad. Don't just follow the latest uh, fad out there, but uh, see many things, see what you like. And you're right, keep on fresh and keep on learning things because that makes you happy and makes you good at what you do anyway. Yeah. So thanks again, Jennifer, that was tremendous. Thanks okay. again uh, so much for taking the time to speak with us today and uh, walk us through your uh, way of getting who you are and doing such a great job in multiple different areas. And, you know, maybe for the CTO guys that were bored, maybe Inoka might be a great way to get you started. So <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Thanks so much, Manos. That was really uh, fun. Um, I appreciate being able to be a part of your podcast. And look forward to seeing you on the elites of the Boston Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> great. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 